say for the sake of argument, you're a liberal journalist in the year 2016 of the Common Era. Your beat is covering the Republican primaries. A lot of people are vying for the presidential nomination, and so it falls to you to attend and write up their debates. Part of your job is deciphering conservative euphemisms. When the subject of illegal immigration comes up, for instance, you'll have to explain to your audience that the idea of protecting American jobs from undocumented workers is Republican double talk for hating Mexicans. No one is tightening security at the US-Canada border, no one is pulling over white Europeans to check their visas, and undocumented workers contribute a massive amount to the economy while taxpayers don't have to cover social security security, unemployment, or Medicare for them. Protecting jobs has always been used to paper over racism. So you're sitting there watching the debate, these factoids at the ready, when one of the candidates says he wants to tighten the borders because Mexico is sending us rapists and thieves. I'm sorry, what? What just happened? That is not a thing Republicans are supposed to say out loud. It's against the rules. You can't just cop to believing Mexicans are degenerates after decades of calling border security a jobs issue. Also, immigrants, legal or otherwise, aren't soldiers since when are they sent by anyone? By the time you pull yourself out of that thought spiral, the debate has shifted. Now they're talking about the war on terror, so you somewhat warily prepare to contextualize another set of euphemisms. This is a subject almost always used to mask Islamophobia. Whenever an act of domestic terror is committed by someone of Palestinian descent, politicians try to link it to ISIS or Al-Qaeda, where if the bomber or shooter is a white Christian, the terrorist is referred to as a lone wolf, not part of any pattern, despite there being significant more white Christian lone wolves than Palestinian terrorists. This war on terror never seems to expand beyond regions with oil deposits. But then that same candidate pipes up and says if elected for the sake of security he wants to create a Muslim registry, and what the hell is going on? Politicians just don't talk like this. Conventional wisdom is that this kind of language will flare up the extremists in your party while alienating your base. And appealing to both at the same time is why we invented euphemisms. And sure enough, in the following months, you have far-right pundits talking about a Muslim ban on national television, waxing nostalgic about the Japanese internment camps of the 1940s like they weren't a national disgrace. You've got that same candidate casting aspersions on the judge investigating him for fraud because the judge is Mexican-American. You're sitting there with your pen ready to write an article about the alienation of the moderate Republican base, but that moment never seems to come. The guy seemingly tanking his candidacy by appealing to extremists is the one who finally secures the nomination. You realize with some shock that in each of these cases you are witnessing the death of a euphemism. The death of a euphemism is a rare celestial event. Politicians only let a euphemism die when they don't need it anymore. This does not imply good things for Mexicans or Muslims. The circumstances under which a euphemism may die are often spelled out in the circumstances under which it is born. So if we want to discuss it, we'll have to start at the beginning. Let's talk about euphemistic racism in the Republican Party. In the year 1964, there was a man. We'll call him Barry, uh, Silver Milk. Silver Milk was the Republican nominee for president, and, for various reasons, he was almost certainly going to lose the election. The Democrats were the incumbent party, they'd pretty much controlled Congress since the 40s, and the country was still in mourning after the devastating assassination of a Democratic president. The United States wasn't looking to change parties. About the only thing Silver Milk had going for him was that the Democrats had just signed into law the Civil Rights Act, expanding the voting rights of black citizens and desegregating a lot of American life and a lot of white voters were pissed about it. In those days, you couldn't really claim Republicans or Democrats were good on race, and black people, when they were allowed to vote at all, were much more evenly split between parties than they are today. However, a Democrat pushing through the Civil Rights Act had, intentionally or otherwise, made race a partisan issue. The upshot, Silver Milk realized, was that disgruntled white people might be willing to abandon the Democratic Party if given the right incentive. 
In 64, Republicans didn't have much of a coalition, not since democratic tax policies had dragged America out of the Great Depression, and incidentally created the greatest period of economic growth and prosperity in the history of the industrialized world, but I'm sure that's just a coincidence. If Silvermilk could siphon white voters out of the Democratic Party, he might bring a strength to Republicans that they hadn't seen in decades. But to do that, he'd have to run his campaign on a pro-segregation platform. Now, white racists have a complicated relationship to their own racism. They seemingly want the impossible. They want segregation without appearing to be segregationists, racist policy without the social repercussions. Possibly, they don't even want to admit their racism to themselves. So Silvermilk would need a framing that allowed the blithely racist, the overtly racist, and the non-racist to unite under a single banner. For this purpose, Silvermilk landed on the long-enduring euphemism, states' rights. Now, obviously, the states' rights argument didn't originate in 1964. It's very old, and in fact used to be more of a Democrat thing. We're talking about the specific invocation of states' rights as a defense of inequality. Silvermilk argued that desegregation, though certainly a nice idea, shouldn't be enacted at the federal level, because no matter how acute the plight of black Americans, the decision to desegregate should be left to the states. Of course, anyone embracing this rhetoric knew full well that many states would never in this lifetime desegregate unless forced to. But you see, that's not the aim, merely the side effect. In this framing, no one is officially pro-segregation, they're simply anti-desegregation. This brokered a compromise between the reactionaries and the centrists in the United States. It allowed moderate Republicans some deniability about what direction their party was headed, and it allowed the Silvermilk campaign to secure the votes of white racists without having to publicly embrace them. Now, in spite of all of this, Silvermilk, as predicted, lost the election in a landslide. But it would be wrong to take that as a rejection of what he tried. This was the beginning of the modern Republican Party. This is where the Deep South, formerly a lock for the Democrats, first voted for the party of Lincoln. This is where white flight from the Democratic Party began, and why today we see white people, particularly white men, are the only demographic that consistently votes Republican. Silvermilk's rhetoric was foundational to bringing Republicans back to power in the 80s, finally breaking the Democrats' hold over the House of Representatives. Some will argue that Silvermilk did sincerely believe in states' rights, and that rebuilding the Republican Party by appealing to white racists was not his intent. And if you believe that, perhaps I can interest you in a very promising real estate venture in Florida. But regardless of what you believe about his intentions, that is how states' rights has been used, as a cudgel in service of bigotry. States' rights was invoked, and is still invoked, to defend anti-miscegenation laws, anti-abortion laws, same-sex marriage bans, trans bathroom bills, spousal rape, you name it. Every time there are gains for social minorities, the Republicans shore up the votes of bigots who find these gains offensive. It's hard for the left to argue with the states' rights argument because it's not designed to make sense. Republicans will say we should leave an issue like same-sex marriage up to the states, but only after a federal ban on same-sex marriage proves infeasible. Up until that moment, they are in favor of government overreach. So states' rights has never been a consistent philosophy. But then why should it be? It's a euphemism. Its sole purpose is bringing an extreme ideology into mainstream politics. About the only blessing of a political euphemism is that the belief that can't be spoken is a belief that is, to some extent, contained. The states' rights argument makes bigotry more pervasive, but keeps it somewhat less draconian than the bigots might prefer. If you have to smuggle your marriage ban into a states' rights argument, you're painted into a corner should your state choose to legalize it. Then, if you want to keep the homophobic vote secure, you've got to find and popularize a different euphemism. Managing an alliance between moderates and reactionaries, especially when you can't acknowledge that one half of that alliance even exists, is a hard needle to thread, and depending on who's in charge of the party at a given time, the alliance can be tenuous. The far right is often viewed by their own party as the madwoman in the attic. We feed her, but we don't talk about her. 
Republican campaigners are somewhat known for going out and getting far-right folks registered to vote, and then talking shit about them when they're out of earshot. I suspect they enjoy standing next to extremists because it makes them look moderate by comparison. Though, we should be clear, if you need to stand next to someone whose bumper sticker says, if I had known this, I would have picked my own cotton to not look racist, your house is not in order. And the far right knows this. Say what you want about them. They're not all fools. Their party often doesn't respect them because it doesn't have to. Who the hell else are they going to vote for? They are the necessary evil. But if what a person wants, what they actually want, is segregation, is a nationwide ban on same-sex marriage, is the mass deportation of Mexicans, is the closing of borders to all Muslim nations, this euphemistic states' rights, job security, war on terror, half-measure bullshit isn't going to cut it forever. When you court the vote of bigots, sooner or later, it's put up or shut up. I don't say this to generate sympathy for them. None of these are desires worth having, and no nation calling itself a democracy should ever represent them, not even as watered-down euphemisms. But to bring us back to the recent past, I say this because in 2016, it had been a long time since these people felt that any party had truly represented them. And this is why a candidate who doesn't say protecting jobs, he says Mexicans are rapists, who doesn't say war on terror, he says Muslim registry, appeals to them. He says, in so many words, the Islamophobes, the racists, the sexists, the segregationists, they are my base. I will not appeal to moderates and treat them as the necessary evil. I will speak to them directly, without euphemism. Because, honestly, I don't know how euphemisms work. These are my people, and they are the ones the Republican Party should embrace with open arms. This is supposed to be political suicide. And in the months that follow, it looks like maybe it will be. All the other journalists are writing this up as a fluke and an embarrassment. Him securing the nomination has doomed the Republican Party. The moderates will never elect him. Not only will he fail, he will lay bare the ugly truth about his entire party. He lags in the polls. Republican lawmakers disavow him. The Republican National Committee revokes their endorsement. Statisticians say not only will he lose in the swing states, but some Republican strongholds might vote Democrat for the first time in 40 years. They suspect he could drag Republicans in the House and Senate down with him. Democratic control of all three branches of government. His loss will be as sweeping as silver milks in 64, and the ensuing Republican realignment will be as dramatic. But when the day comes, that's not the headline you have to write. How do you make sense of this? You're a political writer. You're supposed to tell people what this means. How do you even begin? Well, it means party loyalty is one of the strongest things in politics today. Come election day, people who disavowed him were making phone calls on his behalf. It means the Republican Party has drifted to the right far enough that the so-called moderates are more closely aligned with white nationalists than they are to the moderate left. It means, in all likelihood, the bigots are the base now, and the moderates the hangers-on. Politicians can be as racist as they want, because who the hell else are Republicans gonna vote for? That's not the realignment you were expecting. Now, there's no saying how long this state of affairs will last, one election doesn't mean the center-right and the far-right know how to build a coalition. Maybe a year or two from now, when this guy has passed a little legislation, the moderates will have buyer's remorse, the extremists will feel their guy was more blunt talk than he was action, everything will be worse, and no one will be happy. But that's not much comfort, because it tells you almost nothing about how the next election will go. At this point, anything could happen. A euphemism dies when it no longer works to disguise things that can't be said, or when culture at large decides things that can't be said are now sayable. In the last couple videos, we've talked about how the far-right mainstreams a, for instance, racist idea by convincing people it's not racist. What we're seeing here is the endgame of that process. Once the public embraces them as people, elects their politicians, and implements their policies, they begin, bit by bit, to drop the pretense. Because if they want to close the borders once and for all, it's in their best interest to stop pretending border control is about protecting jobs.
A sad truth about humans is they will often accept almost any justification to keep doing whatever they're already doing. If someone has spent years favoring border security, they've voted for it, their taxes have paid for it, maybe they've even called ICE on someone? And one day you tell them, keep doing what you're doing, but by the way, it's not about jobs anymore, now it's about keeping Mexicans out. A lot of them will roll with it. We like to think action follows belief, and sometimes it does, but at least as often it's the reverse. And that's a dangerous thing when given the choice to do something different or do the same thing only more. To the far right, a euphemism is like a calf. Something to be brought into this world or inherited, removed from its original context, raised to adolescence, and then slaughtered when the time is right. Historically, the first sign that things are about to get a lot worse for minorities is when the racism stops being euphemistic. In a sense, the far right and the liberal journalist share a purpose. The journalist's goal is to expose the truth behind the euphemism in the hopes that people will abandon bigotry once it's been made explicit. The far right does the same, hoping they won't.